Hey guys how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. Today we will see what if Naruto refuses the council. If you enjoy then please like share and do comments. A cool refreshing breeze blew through the village of Konoha on this starless night. But it was not as dark as one would think for the night sky was brilliantly light with flashes of light and the burning multicolored remains of embers that slowly floated to the ground. This spectacle came from the fireworks that were set off to celebrate the demise of the Kayubi that was defeated by the Yandaimi Hokage five years ago. The entire village was decorated in streamers as well as having food and activity stands, which ranged from a simple fish catch game to a more advanced targeting game meant for the shinobi of the village, lined the dusty streets. To the casual observer it seemed like the whole village was into the celebration. But if one would take a closer look at the village they would see that there was one boy who wasn't in a celebratory mood. In fact he was downright terrified every time this day rolled around. The poor boy had yellow uncombed hair that sprouted out in all directions and wore an extremely bright orange jumpsuit. This boy's name was Uzumaki Naruto and he was currently in fear for his life as he fled from a group of angry shinobi. When Naruto landed on a nearby rooftop he let his fear get the best of him and looked over his shoulder to see how close his pursuers were. Unfortunately for him this hesitation was all one of them needed. In a swift and fluid motion this particular shinobi pulled out a kanai and flung it at Naruto just before he shouted, Die Demon. Naruto managed to duck his head at the last moment and dodge the kanai before he pushed himself harder than any five-year-old should have been able to and took off at an incredible speed. As the pursuers chased Naruto all over the deserted areas of the village, he brought his left hand up to a necklace that he had just gotten as a gift, and tightened his grip on it before he thought to himself. If only Anko Nichan was here, she would make them all go away. Just as he finished that line of thought he suddenly felt an intense pain shot through his left leg. Since Naruto didn't want to break his stride he decided to just ignore the pain and continue on. But when he put his full weight on this leg the pain became too much and it gave out. The result of this sent him tumbling into the dark and spooky alleyway below. Naruto hit the ground with such force that you could hear his left leg bone snap. He screamed in pain before he looked down at his leg and saw that not only was his leg twisted in an unnatural position but that the cause of his tumble was a kanai that was still embedded at least two inches into his calf muscle. But before he had the chance to pull it out his pursuers had caught up with him. Despite the pain shooting through his leg Naruto managed to turn over on his stomach and tried to crawl away from the group. When the group saw the wounded boy they quickly descended on him like a pack of vultures and delivered a hailstorm of punches and kicks. Many of these attacks snapped more of Naruto's malnourished bones. As the group continued to beat the poor child one of them, a shinobi from the looks of his headband and standard chunin uniform, ripped the necklace off of Naruto's neck. He then haphazardly threw it into the darkness of the ally while he snarled. A demon doesn't need such things. A few moments later another shinobi started to do hand seals for a kaiden jutsu, but before he could finish the last hand seal the leader of the group put his hand on the man's shoulder as he said, Don't, if you do a jutsu here Hokage-sama or one of his anbu will feel your chakra spike and come to investigate. We don't want to be caught, now do we? The man silently nodded his head in agreement, before the rest Naruto's attackers pulled out a wide variety of weapons, ranging from kanai to swords, and started to hack and slash at Naruto's flesh. While this gruesome scene was going on more of his bones were broken in the process which eliciting a blood-curdling scream before he looked up at his attackers. The only thing he saw however was a look of pure and utter hatred reflected in their eyes. When the pain and blood loss started to make Naruto feel disoriented and drowsy, but before all cognitive ability was lost to him he heard their leader bark out orders. Now that he's dying we need to get rid of the body, so it can't be traced back to us. The leader then pointed to two of his men and said, You too. Take this creature far from here, so it can't be found. As the two men started to head towards Naruto the damage done to his body finally started to take its toll. With his body starting to shut down Naruto used every ounce of willpower he had left to focus his eyes and get one last good look at his attackers. That's when he noticed that they all had red eyes with comma-like marks circling around the iris. With this final scene burned into his memory the world started to fade to nothingness but before he lost consciousness he thought to himself. What did I ever do to deserve this? On the road to Tanzaku town, 
Tsunade felt a shiver run down her spine as the cool night air blew past on the old dusty road surrounded by trees and bushes. Once the breeze had died down she looked up into the star-filled sky and let out a sigh as she wished that she was already in town. She couldn't wait to relax in the hot springs while she drank some of her favorite sake before she hit the gambling halls and end this losing streak she's been on lately. She turned her gaze from the night sky to the long road ahead while she thought about what awaited her once she got to the casinos. I'm going to win so big this time. I can feel it. And then, and then I'll use all those winnings to buy even more of my precious sake. Her fantasy was short-lived as her apprentice, Shizun, noticed two figures coming out of the bushes off to the side of the road, about 50 yards in front of them. Shizun immediately dropped into a defensive stance as she shouted, Who are you? And what are you doing over there? The two men froze in place before they turned to look at Tsunade and Shizun. Once they saw the two they cursed their bad luck before they disappeared in a puff of smoke. Tsunade's right eyebrow arced ever so slightly and she got a curious look on her face as she thought to herself, well that was, strange. She soon forgot all about the two men when she heard a very weak moan coming from the bushes that the two men came from a few moments earlier. Letting her curiosity get the best of her she went over to investigate but when she pushed the bushes aside she froze on her spot and started to tremble. What's wrong Tsunade-sama? asked Shizun as she was overcome with a deep sense of worry at Tsunade's reaction. But when she looked down to see what her mentor was staring at a look of horror spread across her face as she saw the battered and bloody body of a five-year-old boy. Her hands covered her mouth as she thought to herself, oh my god. Her medical training kicked in moments later and she immediately ran over and began to check his condition. However when Shizun turned the boy over Tsunade received another shock to her system because this small child just happened to resemble someone that she cared deeply about a long ago. As she continued to stare at the boy's bloody and dirty face it caused only one thought to run through her head. Aichi looks just like En Nawaki. As she continued to stare visions of her loved one flashed through her mind. She remembered his laughter, his bright vibrant smile and the deep love he held for his friends and family. But then her memories turned dark as images of his dead and mutilated body flashed before the eyes. A low groan broke Tsunade out of her thoughts but when she looked down she didn't see the injured five-year-old, instead she saw her brother Nawaki laying there dying at her feet. She shook her head from side to side to clear the vision from her mind while she thought to herself. No not again, I won't let it happen again. A new resolve coursed through her veins as she found the courage to push aside her fear of blood and she quickly knelt down next to Shizun to begin to heal the badly beaten boy. Tsunade-sama. Though a shell shocked Shizun as she never in her wildest dreams thought her sensei would be able to overcome her fear of blood. Pushing those thoughts to the back of her head for now, she turned all her attention towards helping Tsunade as they tried to save this child's life. The two worked feverishly to save the boy but it was starting to look bleak. That's when Tsunade noticed something odd. A dim red glow enveloped the damaged areas and seemed to help heal the boy at an accelerated rate. Deciding to file this away for a later date she went back to saving this young boy's life. After several hours Tsunade let out a sigh of relief as they had finally managed to heal all of his life-threatening injuries. Tsunade gently picked up the unconscious boy and shoved some of his blood-soaked blonde hair out of his face before she turned to Shizun and said, with all the damage his body sustained, it's a miracle that he was able to live long enough for us to treat him. I completely agree Tsunade-sama, I still can't believe we were able to stabilize him, replied Shizun as she looked at the boy in her master's arms. After a moment of silence between the two women Tsunade grabbed the edge of her green coat and wiped some of the blood and dirt from the boy's face before she said, let's hurry and find a hotel so he can get some rest. Shizun silently nodded her head in agreement and both of them took off towards Tanzuku town as fast as they could safely carry the sleeping boy. A short time later they entered the hotel room and noticed the plain white walls with an open kitchen and two doors in the back one leading to the bedroom while the other lead to the bathroom. Tsunade made a beeline for the bedroom and put the boy down on the soft bed. After she quietly shut the bedroom door she turned to Shizun and whispered, Just who is that boy? There is no way he should have survived all those injuries. I know what you mean Tsunade-sama, I've never seen someone so severely injured before survive. It has to be a miracle, replied Shizun as she let a small smile spread across her face. 
This good feeling didn't last long however because once she noticed the concerned look on her sensei's face she got a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. What's wrong Tsunade-sama? We didn't miss anything did we? No, no nothing like that. It's just, didn't you notice that even without our help his wounds were already healing at a faster than normal rate? Asked Tsunade as she brought her right hand up to her chin to ponder this further. It shouldn't have been possible for that boy's wounds to heal so fast, unless... As realization dawned on Tsunade her apprentice Shizun opened the bedroom door a crack and glanced into the room to check on the boy. As she looked at his sleeping form she muttered, now that you mention it yes. I did notice that his wounds were healing at an unusually fast rate. But where are you going with this sensei? It's just a theory mind you. But I think that he could be a Jinchuriki. Commented Tsunade as she got a sad look on her face. That would also explain why he was beaten to within an inch of his life, and then left for dead. But before they could continue their conversation further they heard a noise coming from the next room, and rushed in to check on the boy. At that very same moment Naruto slowly opened his eyes and let out a low groan of pain as he started to look around the room. The first thing he noticed was that it was a simple white room, with cheap paint on the walls, and an old cracked mirror hanging over a simple wooded dresser. Then as he laid eyes on the old oak door it suddenly swung open and two ladies rushed into the room. The trauma of Naruto's near-death experience became very apparent when his first reaction was to jump out of the bed, run to the nearest corner of the room, curled up into a ball, and screamed at the top of his lungs, Don't hurt me. Tsunade and Shizun both cringed at the sheer terror and panic in the boy's voice. Tsunade decided to implement a different tactic and cautiously made her way over to him while she tried to calm the poor boy down. Shush, just calm down, no one here is going to hurt you. We're the medics that made all your injuries go away. My name is Tsunade, and this lady here is my apprentice Shizun. Now that you know our names could you please tell us yours? Naruto just sat there in shock, he just couldn't believe that this lady didn't know who he was. Everybody knew who he was and they all hated him for it. But out of all the questions swimming around inside his head, there was one that kept coming to the forefront. Why is this lady being so nice to me? After a few moments of silent contemplation he decided to go for broke and answer her question. Naruto lifted his head above his knees and in a soft and quiet voice muttered, I am Uzumaki Naruto. The Kayubi Vessel, Sarutobi Sensei, how could you let this happen to him? Tsunade thought to herself as an overwhelming sadness crept into her heart as her mind pictured the kind of life he must have lead up until now. When he noticed that the pair looked at him with sadness and sorrow instead of the usual fear and hatred the question that had been gnawing at his mind earlier became vocalized. How come you don't know me? Everyone knows me. He then lowered his head as a sense of doom and gloom washed over him before he whispered, and hates me. Tsunade's expression darkened at his words and she promised herself that one day she'd find the ones responsible for Naruto's current mental state and make them pay. Shoving such dark thoughts to the back of her mind she got a warm smile and tried to cheer up the poor boy. Not everyone hates you Naruto. While I can't speak for that village, I can say that Shizune and myself don't hate you. Are really? Naruto whispered hoping against hope that Tsunade was speaking the truth. Her smile took on an even warmer glow than before as she ruffled his hair while she said, Yup. Naruto just sat there in disbelief unable to fully comprehend what he had just been told. Aside from old man Hokage, Anko, and Tuchi and Ayame from the Ichiraku ramen stand everyone else hated him. Man I wish the old man was here. He'd know if I could trust this lady. Naruto thought to himself as he suddenly realized that aside from the two ladies there wasn't anyone else in the room. That's when he quickly scanned the room but couldn't find any trace of the aged Hokage. He started to get really scared as he frantically searched the room again for any sign of him. When no trace could be found of even a visit Naruto started to panic as he spouted out question after question. Where is he? Where's old man Hokage? Did something happen to him? Why hasn't he come yet? He always comes to visit me when I get hurt. That last statement hit Tsunade harder than she thought it would and as dark emotions started to fill her mind a sour look spread across her face before she thought to herself. He's been hurt like this before? Damn it Sarutobi sensei, when I get my hands on you. Taking a few moments to purge those dark thoughts from her mind Tsunade took a deep breath and decided to tell Naruto the truth. Listen Naruto there's no easy way to tell you this, so I'll just come out and say it. 
You're not in Konoha anymore. She paused for a moment to let it sink in but when she saw the confused look on Naruto's face she bit her lower lip in worry before she finished what she was going to say, you're in a town called Kanzaku Naruto. We found you on the side of the road and brought you here. Naruto's reaction was unexpected to say the least, he just had a blank expression on his face and with a voice devoid of all emotion he muttered, so they throw me out, huh? I guess they finally decided to throw out their trash. The torrent of emotions Naruto had bottled up over the years finally reached their limit and tears started well up in his eyes threatening to burst forth at any moment. Tsunade's long dormant maternal instinct started to kick in as she grabbed Naruto and pulled him into a hug. She then rocked him back and forth in an attempt to ease his pain. Not used to such close contact Naruto's muscles tightened ready to escape at a moment's notice. But once he realized that there was no malicious intentions he quickly relaxed into the warm and comforting embrace. The dam finally broke for Naruto and all of his pent-up emotions came to the surface as he buried his face into Tsunade's shoulder and bawled his eyes out. This outpouring of such raw emotion tugged at the two Kanochi's heartstrings, and Tsunade found herself pulling him into an even tighter embrace as she did her best to ease the boy's pain. There, there it's going to be alright. Don't let their words get to you Naruto. Because you're not trash, and don't you dare think otherwise got it? You're far better than that. H how would you know? Sniffled Naruto as he lifted his head and looked at Tsunade with an almost pleading look in his eyes hoping for a thread of truth in her words. Because, Tsunade then got a nice warm smile on her face and put her hand on top of his head before she tousled his hair and said, I know just how special you really are. Those kind words stuck a chord with Naruto. Never before had anyone said he was special and this brought forth an emotion he had very little experience with, happiness. As a new wave of tears streamed down his face he tightened his grip on Tsunade's shirt before he buried his face once again into her shoulder and cried tears of joy. Tsunade gently placed her hand on the back of his head as she continued to rock him back and forth until he finally fell asleep. A faint smile spread across her lips as she ran her fingertips through the young boy's hair and after a few moments of contemplation she came to a decision that would in time rock the very foundation of Konoha. Shizun. I'm. Tsunade stopped for a moment and looked down at the boy, before her eyes reflected a resolve that was thought to have died in her long ago. I'm taking Naruto with us. Are you serious Tsunade-sama? Bakked Shizun as she just stared at her mentor unable to wrap her mind around what she just heard. Soon the turmoil within her mind became vocalized. In all the years I've known you, you've never done anything like this before. So why start now? A vein started to throb on Tsunade's forehead as she stopped playing with Naruto's hair and taking great care not to wake the boy she said. Are you saying that we should just throw him back out there? Just leave him so those jackals can do this again. When Naruto stirred Tsunade was afraid that she'd woken him. But once he just nuzzled closer to her and started to snore she let out a sigh relieved that she hadn't. With that concern out of the way she turned back towards Shizun and glared at her expecting an answer. Oh of course not, I would ever want him to go through that again Tsunade-sama. It's just, Shizun trailed off unsure of how to put her feelings into words but with another harsh glare from her mentor she finally said, I'm surprised that you want to take him with us. After what happened to Uncle Dan and Nawaki, I never thought you'd open your heart up like this again. It's because of Nawaki that I'm doing this. Tsunade mumbled more to herself than Shizun as she once again looked down at the child sleeping in her lap. When Shizun didn't say anything for several seconds Suande looked up at her apprentice only to see her friend's face contorted in confusion. After she let out a deep sigh she explained further. When he was injured out there, at first I didn't see Naruto lying in that ditch. I saw Nawaki. Shizun brought her hands to her mouth and let out a small gasp but before she could say anything Tsunade continued. That's what let me get over my fear and help you save him. I'm not sure if it was Nawaki's spirit guiding me or not. But, Tsunade paused for a moment to collect her thoughts. I do know I feel a connection to this little guy, and I think Nawaki would want me to look after and protect him. And I think Uncle Dan would want that too, Shizun added more as an afterthought than anything else. She then got a meek smile on her face and as she gave a quick nod of agreement she thought to herself. Well I guess it won't be so bad. After all, I've always wanted a little brother. With both ladies in agreement a warm smile spread across Tsunade's face. Then it's been decided. Naru-chan is now part of the Senju clan. Naru-chan? 
muttered Shizun with her right eyebrow arced ever so slightly as she gave her mentor a questioning look. A tinge of pink spread across Tsunade's cheeks as an emotion long thought lost flooded her system but before it could be used against her she decided to quickly change the subject. Anyway since Naru Chan is going to come with us, I think it's time he learned how to defend himself, because I don't want anything like this to ever happen to him again. Don't you agree Shizun? Oh absolutely Tsunade-sama, replied Shizun as she let her lips curl into a warm smile thinking about all the things the two of them coupled teach the young shinobi to be. Tsunade reined her fingers through Naruto's hair one more time before she gently laid her hand on his head. Naruto's reaction to this was to snuggle up even closer to her and left out a sigh of contentment. Tsunade's lips curled into a smile as she looked down at the sleeping blonde and thought to herself, Well Naru-chan, I wonder how you'll react when you find out that you're now part of a family. Hokage Tower the following day. The early morning rays of sunshine came through the window of the Hokage's office accentuating the finely crafted oak desk that the Sandame Hokage was currently working at. Its high finish and ornate design was clearly designed to instill a sense of power and prestige to anyone lucky enough to lay their eyes on it. After he stamped his approval on the document in front of him, he looked over at the huge pile of paperwork that he had yet to complete before he let out an aggravated sign of frustration. He really hated all the backlog of paperwork that was created by his participation in the Kayubi festival the night before. As it approached midday Serutobi had finally started to catch up with all his work and that's when he noticed that Naruto had yet to come by and pay him a visit like he usually did after the festival. This fact alone caused him to become a little concerned. But as the day wore on and he had yet to even receive any news about the boy's pranks or emergency notices concerning the young blonde caused him to become really concerned about the child's well-being. So once Serutobi had finished the last bit of paperwork he was currently on he let out a sigh and got up to go and look for Naruto. Just then a loud commotion could be heard behind the finely crafted wooden doors that lead to the reception area. Then before he could even get out from behind his desk the dual doors got knocked off its brass hinges and went crashing to the ground. As the dust settled to the ground a very pissed off Mitarashi Anko barged into room. Her long tan trench coat moved as though an invisible wind blew past her as she dragged one of the Chunin guards in with her. Once Anko was in front of Serutobi's desk she unceremoniously dropped the guard to the floor and with a glare that would send a shiver down her old sensei's spine she made her aggravation known. All right, where the hell is the gaki? Serutobi let a breath he didn't realize he was holding as all his worries about Naruto's safety melted away. After all if the young woman in front of him is this pissed Naruto must have played a really nasty prank on her. With a grandfatherly smile on his face Serutobi asked, And just what has Naruto done this time? Done, done, what the hell are you talking about? screamed Anko a look of utter disbelief clearly present on her face as she tried to comprehend that he had no clue as to what was going on. Finally her anger and concern for the person in question got the best of her, and as she clenched her fist to contain her rage she snapped, I want to know where the gaki is right now. Taking note of the desperation hidden under all the anger that was just displayed Serutobi got a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. Wanting to get more information before he came to the wrong conclusion Serutobi walked out from behind his desk and he got a serious look on his face to show Anko he wanted answers. Anko-chan you need to calm down and tell me what exactly is going on here. The tone in Serutobi's voice snapped Anko out of her blind rage and after she took a couple of deep breaths to help collect her thoughts she told him what she had discovered. Look, all I know is that after I got back from my mission, I went to go check on the gaki and wish him a belated birthday, since I missed it yesterday. She sent a harsh glare at the Hokage to get her point across that she wasn't happy about that at all. When she saw the man flinch under her gaze she got a small smirk on her face before she continued with her story. But when I got there the door was unlocked and the place was a mess. Anko-chan, interrupted the Hokage as he grabbed the tip of his hat and pulled it down slightly as he started to wonder if Anko had pushed herself too hard in the last mission to make it back here so fast. You know Naruto never locks his door and his place is always a mess. That's not what's got me worried, retorted Anko, as she got right in the Hokage's face to emphasize her next point. There was ramen spewed all across his kitchen table and a shattered bowl on the floor. When Serutobi heard this the sinking feeling he had in his stomach earlier dropped into a bottomless pit as he thought to himself, Naruto would never let a bowl of ramen go to waste, 
This is not good, not good at all. Without a moment's hesitation Sarutobi went over to his desk and pushed the intercom button just to the right of his big pile of paperwork before he said, I want Kakashi in here now. Tell him if not here in the next 10 minutes then I'm going to make him a Janin sensei and have them doing nothing but D-rank missions until I say otherwise. Why why yes Hokage-sama. His secretary quickly stuttered and the faint nose of a chair being knocked over could be heard from the other side of the intercom before it went silent. With that out of the way Serutobi's mind quickly went to what would be needed for when Kakashi arrived and once he came up with a plan of action he turned to Anko and relayed his orders, Anko if Kakazi is going to be able to find Naruto we'll need something that has Naruto's scent on it. Go to his apartment and find whatever you can to accomplish this task. I'm on it Hokage-sama, replied Anko as she quickly bowed her head in respect of the aged leader before she channeled her chakra and vanished in a swirl of leaves. Not even five minutes later Anko puffed back into the room with what was needed to find Naruto, his funny little nightcap with two big teeth hanging down in the front and giant eyes sewn into the material. But as the time passed the 10 minute mark Anko got more and more agitated until she was no longer able to stand still and she started to pace around the Hokage's office in order to vent her frustration. Then when the time nearly hit the 20 minute mark she could no longer contain her rage and she slammed her fist into the wall as she snarled, where in the seven hells is he? As if to answer her question the oak doors to the Hokage's office opened and in walked Kakashi, with a lazy carefree expression on his face. However before he could give his customary greeting Anko grabbed him by his janin vest and slammed him into the wall so hard cracks began to form. She then pulled out a kanai and placed it up against his crotch before she growled, what the hell took you so long Kakashi? And I swear to Kami if you don't have a good reason, I'll give you a change right here. Though Kakashi didn't show any reaction to his current situation on the outside, mentally however he was sweating bullets, especially when he felt the tip of the kanai press up against his precious manhood with enough pressure to cause some discomfort without any serious harm being done. Still after pondering the situation he didn't think she would actually go through with it with the Hokage present, so he simply just stared at Anko and in his usual carefree way said, well you see there was this problem with my mask. It seems to have shrunk in the wash so I had to go buy a new one. Anko's right eyebrow twitched in irritation for several moments before she tightened her grip on his vest and shouted, Okay that's it. It's time to say goodbye to your little friend Kakashi. But before she could go through with her threat Serutobi grabbed her wrist and after he gave her a harsh glare that sent a clear signal that he wasn't in the mode for these games he said, Anko I know you're distressed over Naruto, but I will not tolerate you maiming my shinobi. Now release Kakashi so we can proceed with the task at hand. After a moment's hesitation Anko pulled the kanai away from Kakashi's nether regions and released her grip on him before she stormed over to the other side of the room grumbling about lazy perverts and wanting to castrate them all. With Kakashi out of Anko's crosshairs for now Serutobi leveled his gaze on the man and said, Kakashi I don't have time to deal with your tardiness right now so we'll talk about that later. Once he let that sink into the Janin's head he pulled out the nightcap Anko retrieved early and relayed his orders to his tardy Janin. Now Naruto is missing and it is possible that he's hurt. Use this to track him down immediately. Hi Hokage-sama, replied Kakazi as he was already going through a series of hand seals and channeling the chakra necessary to perform the jutsu needed. After he formed the last hand seal needed he slammed his hand onto the ground and called out the name of the jutsu. Kachiyose no jutsu. A puff of smoke erupted from his hand, and encompassed an area the size of a chair. Then once it cleared a dog wearing a Konoha headband could be seen sitting in the very spot Kakashi's hand was just moments before. Yo, was the pudgy little dog's greeting as he waved his right front paw, but when he noticed the Hokage and a very irate Kunoichi he turned towards his summoner and asked, Ah, oh, what's up Kakashi? Pakun we have a problem. It appears that Naruto is missing and we need you to track him down. Stated Kakashi as Serutobi not wanting to waste any more time pulled out the child's nightcap for the dog now known as Pakun to sniff. Pakun took one whiff of the nightcap before his highly sensitive nose picked up the scent of the one thing he detested most in the world. His face turned a dark shade of green and as he brought his two front paws up to his mouth to restrain his gag reflex he said, Does this kid bath in ramen? I mean really who could really enjoy that vile stuff anyway? 
Anko made it across the room in the blink of an eye and picked up the small dog by the scruff of the neck before she snarled. I don't give a shit what your personal opinion of his eating habits is. Now can you track his scent or not? Jeez lady what's got your panties in a bunch? Questioned Pakun but when he felt her tight in her grip he decided to not push her any further and started to rapidly sniff the air in the hopes of placating the pissed off women. Just then a faint breeze blew in from the open window and he stiffened he picked up the scent of blood mixed in with a heavy dose of ramen. He quickly wiggled out of Anko's iron grip and as he jumped out the window he said, quickly follow me. Anko, Kakashi, and Sarutobi wasted no time and followed the little dog out the window and into the streets of Konoha. After several minutes of running along the tiled rooftops of the older wooden buildings of Konoha in the early evening hours, Pakun's sensitive nose finally located the source of the blood mixed with ramen scent and jumped down into the garbage and maggot-infested alleyway below. When the others landed in the alley they were frozen in place at the scene that lay before them. If a common villager were to look around this particular alleyway they would have gotten a sick feeling deep in the pit of their stomach. This particular alleyway was covered in blood, from the walls to the dumpsters. Even the ground had a large pool of blood in one spot close to the back of the alley. As Anko surveyed the scene in hopes of finding any clue to Naruto's well-being her eyes caught sight of a simple blood-soaked necklace just lying on the ground. Anguish and despair began to overtake her being and as the tears started to well up within her eyes, Anko focused solely on the necklace that she recognized all too well before she mumbled to herself, No. Flashback three days ago Naruto's apartment. But Anko Nichan, whined a watery-eyed Naruto who was barely able to hold back the tears that threatened to run down his face. As he looked up at Anko he gave her the best puppy dog eyes he could muster in the hopes that he could get her to change her mind. You promised me that you would be with me on my birthday. The sheer outpouring of emotion caused a sad smile to spread across Anko's face and in an attempt to lighten his mood a little she placed her hand on his head and started to ruffle his hair before she tried to explain the situation. Look brat I'm sorry I really am, but orders are orders. The mission is real important for our village, and is expected to last at least three days. This means that I won't be able to get back to the village until the day after your birthday. Now suck it up, you're a big boy right? And big boys don't get upset about things like this. Oh okay, sniffled Naruto as he tried his best to be the big boy he wanted to be and make his sister figure proud of him. When Anko saw how hard Naruto was trying to put up a brave face she got down on one knee so that they were face to face and she lightly ruffled his hair again before she said, Well brat, since I won't be here for your birthday. I think I'm just going to have to give you your present a little early. Naruto's mood instantly brightened at the prospect of actually receiving something from someone other than the Hokage. His bright and vibrant eyes watched intently as Anko put her hands behind her neck and removed the necklace she was wearing. She then carefully put the necklace around Naruto's neck before she clasped the two ends together. She then gave it a gentle tug to make sure it was secure. Once her she got back to her feet she let a smile cross her face as she watched Naruto examine his new possession with the awe and reverence only a child could have. Now I expect you to take good care of that alright, said Anko as she put her hand on his head and ruffled his hair one more time. After Naruto got away from Anko's antics he gave her the best foxy smile he hand and cheerfully replied, You bet Anko Nichan. I'll never take it off. That's a promise. End flashback. Oto Uto? Anko thought to herself as the emotional turmoil became too much and she collapsed to her knees. With a shaky hand she picked up the necklace and once it was in her hands she could no longer hold back the current of emotions she'd had bottled up since she first found that destroyed bowl of ramen. As the tears slowly rolled down her face she made a silent prayer. Please be alright, I, I don't know what I'd do if I lost you too. Meanwhile Seru Tobi had just finished surveying his surroundings with a heavy heart, and as he rubbed some of the blood he had wiped of the walls between his fingers he thought to himself, with this much blood all over the place, it's unlikely that anyone could have survived. Naruto, were you really the one hurt in this alleyway? When he was brought out of his thoughts by the sounds of sobbing he quickly shifted his gaze over to the source only to find Anko on her knees clutching what appeared to be a simple necklace with tears streaming down her face. Anko's crying? I've never seen her cry so openly before. What did she find that put her in such a state? The bewildered Hokage thought to himself as he made his way over to the poor girl. 
By the time he made it over to her he finally got a good look at the necklace that she had in her hands. It was a simple amulet with what appeared to be a rope tied around it. And that's when his eyes widened in horror as he finally placed where he had seen it before. Oh my god. That's the necklace that Anko gave Naruto for his birthday. Sarutobi's desire to find Naruto doubled and he quickly used his advanced shinobi skills to scan the alley yet again in the hopes of finding any sign of Naruto but with this attempt came to no avail he turned his attention to Kakashi and relayed his new orders, Kakashi. Gather your most trusted Anbu, and start searching the village and the outlining areas for any sign of Naruto, we need to find him now. Obeying his orders without question Kakashi merely nodded his head in acknowledgement before he disappeared in a puff of smoke. Once they were alone in the alleyway Serutobi placed his hand on Anko's shoulder and put on his best grandfather face in an attempt to reassure the distraught woman. Don't worry Anko-chan I'm sure that Naruto is just fine. But when Anko didn't respond to him and just continued to stare at the necklace she was holding with a far off look on her face. He sighed in frustration and finally let his emotions to the surface by allowing a single tear to run down the side of his cheek. After his little outburst of emotion he turned his gaze towards the Hokage monument and more specifically the Yandame Hokage's sculpted face and thought to himself. I'm so sorry Minato-san, but it looks like I failed you. Tanzaku Town the early morning rays of sunshine came through the window and started to bath the hotel room in its warm light, and when those rays fell upon a young blonde boy, who was still resting his head in Tsunade's lap, began to stir. Naruto slowly opened his eyes and as he rubbed the sand from them he noticed that his pillow was unusually warm and comforting, as if it was filled with the love and compassion that was sorely missing in his life. But when he looked up and saw that his head was in the lap of a blonde-haired lady the memories of what happened the night before flashed before his eyes. Once his recollection was complete he instinctively reached for the necklace his Nichan gave him only to discover that it was no longer in his possession. After a frantic check on his person with still no sign of the necklace the realization that he broke his promise to Anko sunk in and he did the only thing he could do. He curled himself into a ball and let the tears freely flow down his cheeks. As the sounds of Naruto's crying became louder and louder the noise started to rouse a still groggy Tsunade. She slowly opened her eyes and stared at the ceiling above her for several moments before she glanced over at the far wall and saw the time on the clock. Man, I really hate mornings. She thought to herself just as the sounds of Naruto's crying reached her ears. When she turned to look at the blonde-haired boy she got a pain in her heart at seeing him in such an emotional state. With the gentlest of gestures she tapped him on the shoulder and asked, What's wrong Naruchan? I didn't squash any part of you while I slept did I? The moment Tsunade heard what she had said she flinched and let out an aggravated sigh as she thought to herself, that sounded really lame. Arg, I'm no good at this sort of thing. No, nothing like that. Sniffled Naruto as he wiped the underside of his nose before he lowered his head so that his chin rested on his knees and mumbled. I broke my promise to Anko Nichan. You have a sister? Tsunade practically shouted as she racked her brain but couldn't recall Naruto having any surviving relatives. In fact the only person she could think of that would qualify as family was his rumored godfather Jiraiya, but since he never took any responsibility in raising the boy she quickly dismissed that as a possibility. She's not my real sister, muttered Naruto as he rubbed his puffy red eyes to clear his watery vision. He then looked up at Tsunade and when he saw her questioning look he elaborated, but after she saved me last year she started to look after me. You know check to make sure I was alright and stuff like that, when she wasn't on a mission of course. She even trained me on how to avoid the villagers. That way they wouldn't be able to hurt me. Sounds like she cares about you very much. Tsunade whispered into Naruto's ear as she allowed a faint smile to cross her lips at the news that not everyone in that horrible village hated him before she decided to discreetly get a hold of this person and inform them of Naruto's survival and who knows she may even agree to be their eyes and ears within the village. An advantage that would be invaluable in the future should they ever come to suspect that Naruto survived. Yeah, I guess she does, chirped Naruto as a warm fuzzy feeling filled his being at the thought of all that Anko had done for him, then his mind drifted to their last meeting. She even gave me my first birthday present early, because she would be on a mission and would miss it. It was this necklace that she always wore. Added Naruto as tears started to well up and threaded to overflow as he reached up to where the necklace hung from his neck just the day before he sniffled. A and, 
and then, it was taken from me when those shinobi with weird eyes attacked me. Without a second thought Tsunade pulled Naruto into a hug and gently rubbed the back of his head while she whispered reassuring words in his ear. Shush, it's alright, you didn't break your promise to your sister. Always remember that it wasn't you that lose the necklace. It was taken from you and I'm sure she won't hold that against you. She cares too much for you to do that. Once Naruto started to calm down Tsunade looked down at the boy and asked the question that had been bugging her since he made that comment about the eyes. Naru-chan you said they had weird eyes. Could you tell me a little more about that? I'll never forget those eyes as long as I live. Naruto mumbled to himself as his eyes glazed over slightly when he pulled that terrible memory to the surface. They were red with these weird marks that went around in a circle. They were filled with so much hate that, that, Naruto never got to finish his thoughts as Tsunade pulled Naruto into an even tighter hug and without even a word spoken between the two Naruto buried his head into her chest and began to cry anew. Tsunade let out a sigh of despair at the emotional outpouring of the poor neglected child before she looked out the nearest window and hardened her gaze as she thought to herself, so it was the Uchiha clan that did this to him. I swear, one day I'll make them pay for this. After her little moment with Naruto Tsunade realized that she had yet to hear a peep out of Shizune. But when she looked over where she last remembered seeing her apprentice she couldn't help the smile that spread across her face. The reason for this was simple she saw Shizune with her head on the tabletop with a little bit of drool dripped out of the bottom of her mouth that formed a small puddle on the tabletop and her arms just daggling at her side. I swear Shizune, you can sleep anywhere. Tsunade thought to herself as she shook her head at her apprentice's sleeping habits. While all this was going on Naruto had managed to calm himself from his earlier crying fit and asked the one question that had been swirling around in his head since Tsunade told him where she found his broken body. Tsunade-san, what will happen to me now? Tsunade couldn't help herself she chuckled at his comment and figuring she'd killed two birds with one stone said, Naruto, please don't call me Tsunade-san. After all, is that any way to address your new Ka-san? Unable to believe what he just hear he just sat there frozen in place, and after he got over the shock his eyes got as big as dinner plates. But with a nagging voice in the back of his head telling him he heard her wrong Naruto pulled away from Suande and in a quivering voice mumbled, WW what did you just say? I said, Tsunade paused only for a moment so that she could put her left hand under his chin and she raised his head so he could get a clear look at her face. She then let her smile get even bigger before she continued, Is that any way to address your new Ka-san? After all, I've decided to take you with us and raise you as my own. That is, if you'll have me. Naruto got really quiet and he lowered his head so that his hair covered his eyes but just as Suande started to worry that he was going to take this the wrong way he said, Can you promise me just one thing? But before Suande had a chance to form any kind of rely he lifted his head up so that they made direct eye contact and as a few tears rolled down his cheeks he finished his line of thought. Promise me, promise me that you won't abandon me? I don't want to be alone anymore. Tsunade's smile softened as she quickly enveloped him in a hug and in a tone that one would expect a mother would use to comfort her child she said, Don't worry my little Naru-chan. I promise that neither Shizune nor I will ever leave you. You won't ever be alone again. When Naruto heard this he returned her hug this time and with a genuine smile on his face he kept repeating over and over, I have a family. I have a family. Now Naru-chan, Tsunade started to say but stopped and decided to wait until he had calmed down from his excitement at finally having a family. When she saw that she had gained his full attention she continued, what do you say we go wake up Shizun? That way we can properly celebrate you joining your new family. Naruto jumped out of Tsunade's embrace and pumped his fist into the air as he shouted, Yeah. I've never been able to celebrate anything before so this is going to be so awesome. Without any form of prompting from Tsunade Naruto ran over to the where Shizun still slept and jumped onto Shizun's back while he said, Wake up Nei-chan. I want to go celebrate with my new family. The poor victim of the boy's attack shot up from her chair and much to the surprise of Suande Naruto managed to stay on Shizune's back by wrapping his arms around her neck. As Shizune looked over her shoulder at the blonde-haired boy shock was clearly evident on her face as she shrieked, What's going on? Ignoring her apprentice's question Tsunade walked up to the pair with a smile on her face as she said, Now since we are celebrating Naru-chan's introduction into my clan, I'll let him decide where we should go. 
Tsunade's smile got even bigger when she saw the look of shock and awe on Naruto's face at being able to choose whatever he wanted. When she saw that he wasn't going to respond right away she asked, Well Naru-chan, what would you like to have to commemorate the day you gained a family? The shock and awe was quickly replaced by an overwhelming sense of happiness a deep happiness that he has never experienced before and as his fox-like smile got plastered all over his face he shouted, Ramen. We find Anko walking down the street with a sneer on her face as she passes by some villagers who quickly get out of her way. In the past to two weeks Anko has started to get a reputation for being even more of a sadist, or as some have come to call her, the psychotic snake witch, for stopping any and all parties that celebrated Naruto's death. Any villager that got on her bad side on this issue, wound up in the hospital with many lacerations and a couple broken bones. One person even wanted to find Naruto's body just so they could burn it, to give him a proper send-off back to hell. This comment got he strung up in front of the Hokage Tower, upside down in nothing but his underwear with a kanai with a note that said, say that again and I won't miss next time, just inches for his family jewels. After passing by the villagers Anko face softened when she thought about Naruto's death. She still couldn't believe that he was really gone, and she didn't fail to see the irony of losing him to an attacking mob, after all that's how they first met. Flashback one year ago, a 16-year-old Anko was walking down the street mentally congratulating herself for passing her exam and making Tokubetsu Junin. When she heard the muffled cries of a group of people coming from the other side of the street. As Anko makes her way to the front of the crowd she couldn't help but think, what's got all these people so worked up? When she finally got to the front of the crowd, she stopped dead in her tracks, for right in front of her was a small boy, no older than 3 or 4 years of age, lying down in the mud, his blonde hair matted with mud and dried blood, his left arm bent in an unnatural position, clearly broken, and several minor cuts and bruises all over his body. After hearing comments like, demon brat, told the demon, and, why don't you go back to hell, that's where you belong after all. Anko couldn't help feel sympathy for the boy as she too was treated badly because of her sensei gone missing Nen, but her thoughts went in a different direction, so that's the Kayubi vessel, can't these people tell the difference between the demon and its jailer? I mean my father taught me a little about seals, and even I can tell the difference. Thinking of her father put a frown on her face, thinking back to what the council forced her to do, damn council, won't even let me take my father's clan name even though I'm a Tokubetsu Junin now. Those old bustards will only let me take my mother's maiden name of Mitarashi. Being brought out of her thoughts as she a knife being thrown at the boy, she reacts without a second thought. Anko jumped in front of the boy and deflected the knife. Anko gets into a defensive position, and yells, what the hell do you think you're doing? While she scans the crowd for any more attacks, we're getting right of the demon. What does it look like, you snake whore? Shouted someone in the crowd. Anko's right eyebrow started to twitch as she looked at the crowd, snake whore, snake whore. First you try to kill a small child then you just have to insult me. That's it, you're all going to pay now Kachiyose no jutsu, as she slammed her hand into the ground and several dog-sized snakes appear. All right boys go and have your fun, just don't make their pain end too quickly, said Anko with a sadistic look on her face. Upon hearing the jutsu that this defender of the demon used, Many in the crowd started to panic and flee the scene. Just as the snakes were about to attack, Kanai came raining down, dispersing all of the snakes in a cloud of smoke. When the cloud of smoke cleared, Anko found out that Naruto and herself were surrounded by Anbu. Glaring at the dog-faced Anbu, Anko couldn't help but yell, Why did you stop me? These little maggots need to be taught a lesson. It's because you went too far Anko. Came the reply of an elderly man in white robes and a hat with the kanji of fire on it. Anko's eyes widened in surprise at the comment, as she said, Hokage-sama, you can't mean that, you're just going to let them get away with this. Sarutobi brought a hand to the brim of his hat and pulled it down, closed his eyes and took a deep sigh. He then opened his eyes to meet Anko's eyes, seeing the hurt and confused look in them he told her, Anko, I happy to see that you've protected Naruto and I have no intention of letting them go unpunished, but I can't just let you go and do whatever you want them either. Think about it Anko then you would be no better than them, and besides what do you think your father would have done if he was still with us? At the comment about her father, her put her head down with her hair covering her eyes thinking, the old man's right, father would have handled that a little differently, but I'm not my father. 
Anko comes out of her thoughts as she feels a tug on the sleeve. She looks down only to find little Naruto holding onto her sleeve while in the Hokage's arms. Are you telling me the squirt was still conscious after all that? What a minute, when did the old man pick him up? Filing those questions away for later, Anko heard Naruto mumble something to her. Leaning in closer to him, she smiles down at him saying, what was that squirt? Naruto looks up with a weak smile on his face and with a soft voice says, thanks for saving me from the mean people, I'm a little, yawn, sleepy I think, I'll take a nap now. As he closes his eyes and goes to sleep. After Naruto fell asleep Sarutobi looked at Anko with a smile on his face, don't worry Anko, he's just fallen asleep. He's safe now, so you can just go on home and get some rest, we'll take him to the hospital. But, escapes her lips as she glances down at Naruto. Sarutobi let out a sigh, I can assure you, he is quite alright, but you need to go home and get some rest after all you had a busy day, what with the exams and now this incident, now don't make me have to turn this into an order. Lowering her head in defeat she replies, yes Hokage-sama, as Sarutobi and the Anbu squad took off for the hospital. As she started off toward her apartment, she glances back in the direction of the hospital. Her only thoughts were, at least he's safe now. End flashback. Coming out of her thoughts Anko realizes that she stopped right in front of Ichiraku's ramen stand. Looking over at the two empty seats that she and Naruto would always sit in, she couldn't help but see two ghostly figures sitting there. One was of herself sitting there listening to the other ghostly figure of Naruto as he was smiling and laughing about something that happened that day. Shaking her head to clear the image from her mind she continues onto her apartment. As she starts to open the front door to her place she can't help but wonder about something, why did they take the body, and not even bother to clean up the alleyway? They must have known that the council would not pursue the matter without hard evidence of an actual murder, then that means the ones who killed my O Tuto had to be Shinobi. Besides I trained him to well for him to be caught by those damn villagers. After locking her door Anko starts to turn around to head into her living room when a big puff of smoke appears right in front of her. Anko jumps back, almost slamming into her front door, as she makes a quick jerking motion with her right hand to make a kanai appear. When the smoke clears Anko just gets a purely dumbfounded look on her face as she sees a slug that is as big as an Inazuka clan dog with what looked like two scrolls wrapped in its antenna. Before Anko can even do anything the slug looks straight at her and says, Excuse me young lady, but would you happen to be, Anko Nichan, by any change? Out of all the possible things Anko was expecting to happen, being asked that one question was not one of them. Her eyes grew wide and her left hand went up to the necklace around her neck and put it into a vice-like grip. Only one person ever called me that, but he's dead. So how does this slug know that name? Recovering from her shock a moment later, Anko narrowed her eyes at the slug. A frown appeared on her lips as she gets a tighter grip on the kanai in her right hand. Who wants to know? Without even missing a beat the slug responds. My mistress, Tunade sama asked me to deliver these two letters to a person, according to Tsunade-sama's new charge anyway, named, Anko Nichan, at this location. You match the description given to me by my mistress's young charge, so I figured that you must be this, Anko Nichan, he told me about. Tsunade Sama, as in the legendary slug Sonin? Her new charge? What the hell is going on here? Taking a deep sigh, Anko replies, Yeah, that's me. Might as well find out what's going on. The slug extended its right antenna to show Anko the first scroll labeled, Anko Nichan. I'm to wait to see if you want to give a response to those letters. Whatever. As Anko's trembling hands opened the first scroll, Dear Anko Nichan, I'm writing this to let you know that I'm alright. Sorry for taking so long to get in touch, but Kasin wanted to make sure that you were the only one to get this letter. Oh yeah, I've got a Kasin and another Nichan now can you believe it? They really want to take care of me, me the orphan that nobody wanted. Okay almost nobody, sorry Nichan. Anyway my cousin's name is Tsunade. She's some hotshot medic nin or something, and my other Nichan's name is Shizun she's Kasin's apprentice. Hey guess what Kasin says she is. Going to take me on as an apprentice and train me to be stronger. Nichan, there's something I need to tell you, when I got attacked they took the necklace you gave me for my birthday, please forgive me for breaking my promise to never take it off. I would really like to tell where I am, but all I know is that it's a town a long way away from you. Kasin told me the 
She's writing a letter to you as well and give you this place's name, anyway. I hope you come visit us really soon. Bye Anko Nichan hope to talk to you. Later. Naruto. Anko's eyes tears of happiness came down her face and her lips curled into a smile. As she read the letter again and then look at the little scribble of a Naruto head with a foxy grin and one hand in a victory sign. He's alive. He's really alive. I can't believe he's still alive. With a smile still on her face Anko put the letter from Naruto down on the table and picked up the second scroll labeled Anko-san. As she opened it she couldn't help but wonder what Tsunade Sane would want to write about. To Anko-san. Hello Anko-san if Naruto hasn't already told you my name is Tsunade. I'm writing this letter to inform you of some matters that have come to my attention, the first is to let you know that I am indeed making Naruto my son and apprentice. I won't go into details as to why I decided this, but I will say this I plan on making, Konoha regret there. Decision in trying to get right of him. I'm going to train him to be the best medical ninja this world has ever seen. The second matter is one of the most important we need to discuss. Under no circumstances are you to let anybody know that Naruto is alive. You can't even tell Serutobi sensei. If you tell him he will have to inform the council and as you know there are probably many people on the council that would use this chance to make naruto was never heard from again i will not let that happen even if it means that i have to become a missing nin the final matter i need to inform you on concerns the attack on naruto when shizune and i found his he was barely clinging to life in fact if it wasn't for the kyubi naruto wouldn't be alive right now he had cut and deep gashed all over his body his left leg was fractured, the right arm was completely snapped in half, he had several cracked ribs, and was suffering from some internal bleeding. At the point Anko gritted her teeth and was using every once of willpower the knot. Crumple Tsunade's letter, after we were able to heal his injuries, I had a talk with him about the attack, luckily he can't remember most of what happened to him, I just hope that this means the trauma of the attack is kept to a minimum. Anyway Naruto does remember one thing about his attackers, and that is their eyes, he said they have red eyes with black commas in them, ring any bells? Anko's eyes narrowed and some wrinkles appeared on the paper, she only hand one thought, Uchiha's. They're going to pay for hurting my Otuto. If you guessed the Uchiha clan, then you're corrected, but before you do anything stupid a little piece of advice, don't do anything to the Uchiha clan until you have some evidence of them being involved in the assault. Now if you want to see Naruto again we will be in Tanzuku town for at least two to three more weeks before moving on. So I recommend that you get some time off and permission to leave the village for that period of time. I really don't care how you do it, but I know for a fact that Naruto would really like to see you again. Tsunade. After she finished reading Tsunade's letter Anko turned to the slug, Alright could you tell Tsunade-sama that I will be there as soon as I can. I want to talk to her about the brat's training, and about, this clan problem. Very well Anko-san I shall relay the message for you, goodbye. The slug then disappeared in a puff of smoke. After the slug left Anko went about gathering all the stuff she would need for her trip to Tanzuku town. When she had all her things packed she locked her apartment and headed for the Hokage tower. Hokage tower. Sarutobi was sitting at his desk working on the latest batch of paperwork when he heard a knock on the door. Thankful for the little distraction he looked up at the door and said, enter. When Anko enters the Hokage office she sees the Hokage looking at her with a smile on his face. Deciding to get straight to the point of her visit she blurts out, Hokage-sama. I request to have two to three weeks of so I can get my head together. Seeing no reaction from the Hokage Anko decided to continue, I would also like to have your permission to go and leave the village to visit some of the other villages in fire country. I just need to get away from here for a little while. Upon hearing this Serutobi was deep in thought. He knew that Naruto's death had hit her heart and that she needed time to grieve, so being the kind-hearted person he was, released a deep sigh and said this, Very well Anko. I'll give you your three weeks, and I'll even let you visit the other towns in fire country, but I want to be notified of what town you are in and where you will be staying so that I can contact you in case something comes up alright. Getting a big smile on her face Anko bows to the Hokage and says, 
Thank you Hokage-sama and I think I will go to Tanzuku town first so I can see the sights and try to clear my head. Smiling at Anko Serutobi dismisses her so she can start her vacation. I just hope this helps you come to terms with Naruto's death. When Anko steps outside of the Hokage office she grabs her pack she heads out of the tower and toward Tanzuku town. I'll be there soon oh Tuto, and when I get there I'm going to help you become even stronger, so that this place realizes what a mistake they've made. Naruto still couldn't believe this was happening to him. First he is nearly killed by a mob of shinobi, then to be found by Tsunade and Shizune, who just happened to be walking by, and then they decide to take him under their wing. In fact Tsunade has spent most of the last two weeks getting to know Naruto. She has even started to call him Naru-chan. Naruto is now, in the forest just outside of Kanazuku town with Tsunade and Shizune, in just a blue t-shirt a tan pair of pants and a pair of sneakers, waiting for his training to begin. Alright Naru-chan before we begin your training I need to know if you know what chakra is and how to channel it. Tsunade asked. Of course Kasen, we covered what chakra is and how to channel it at the academy about a month ago. Good, that will make things easier, now I have just one more question. What do you plan to do with the training that I'm going to give you? Well if we were still in the village, I would want to use the training to fulfill my dream of becoming Hokage, so everyone would stop disrespecting me and acknowledge my existence, dot but after everything that has happened lately I don't know if I want that anymore. Tsunade's eyes glazed over at this comment thinking of her brother Nawaki and her loved one Dan. She is brought out of these thoughts when Naruto continued. I may not be sure of my dreams anymore, but there is one thing that I know I will do from now on. I must get stronger so I can protect the ones I care about. I will not let anyone take them away from me. Naruto said with a fierce determination in his eyes. Tsunade couldn't help but smile, at least the villagers haven't completely destroyed his kindness or his determination. Alright Naru-chan since you know how to mold chakra, why don't you do so now so I can see what we have to work with. As Naruto put his hands into a ram seal and started to gather his chakra, Tsunade and Shizune were floored by how much chakra he was producing. Both of them we thinking the exact same thing, what the hell. He's got more chakra than most genin have a year after they graduate, and he's only 5 years old for crying out loud. H how can he have so much chakra, asked a startled Shizune. The smile on Tsunade's face got even bigger at this revelation. That's enough Naru-chan, you did a great job. Konoha has no idea that they let such a promising shinobi slip through their fingers, but I plan on making them see how foolish they were. Naruto got a foxy grin on his face as he rubbed the back of his head. Thanks Kasen, but I've never been complimented before. Is there anything I'm supposed to do? Tsunade's smile turned into a frown at that comment. No Naru-chan just saying thank you really all there is. Before Tsunade could continue a slug appeared next to her and delivered Anko's message, causing the smile to return to her face. Naru-chan come over here for a second okay. What is it Kasen? I've got some good news for you. It looks like Anko-san is coming to visit you after all. Naruto's smile returned to his face as he hugged Tsunade, I get to see anko Nichan. Patting his head she couldn't help but return the hug, while saying, Come on Naru-chan it's time to start your training. Releasing the hug and getting a serious look on her face, Tsunade starts to explain the exercise, okay the first thing we're going to work on is your chakra control. Since you have such a large chakra reserve it will be a little harder for you to control it, but with some time and hard work you will be able to get as good as me, if not better. Nodding his head Naruto couldn't wait to start learning so he could make them proud of him. So what kind of control technique are you going to teach me? tree climbing, but you can only use your feet when climbing the tree. What? How can you climb a tree without using your hands? Tsunade couldn't help but smile at his reaction, by focusing your chakra on the bottom of your feet and regulating it just right so you stick to the surface of the tree. Here I'll show you. As she focused her chakra and started to climb up the side of the tree. Now you might want to get a running start at the beginning to get some momentum. She then threw a kanai at Naruto's feet, use this to mark your progress. Picking the kanai up Naruto started to run at a tree and started to run up the side. He was able to get 4 steps up the tree before he fell down to the ground. Looking back at the tree with an intense glare Naruto focused his chakra again and ran up the tree. This time he got a little bit further before he fell back to the ground. Remember Naruto-chan you need to regulate your chakra flow in order to stick to the tree. 
Shizun encouraged. Taking a few seconds to think about this he tried it one more time and managed to make it halfway up the tree before he lost his grip. Tsunade couldn't help but be amazed at how quickly Naruto was able to grasp the concept of the technique. Unbelievable Naru-chan has already been able to progress this far, with this genin level technique. If he's able to put this mush focus into all of his training there's no telling how powerful he may become. For the next couple of days Tsunade had Naruto focus on tree climbing. She wanted to improve his control before she started his medical just you and taijutsu training. Naruto would continue to climb up and down the tree until it became second nature to him. This is the scene that one Enko Mitarashi came upon when she arrived. She was completely surprised by what her Otuto was doing. Hey Gaki, when did you learn to control your chakra so well? She asked as she walked up to the group. Naruto instantly recognized that voice and quickly turned and ran toward the person and enveloped them in a hug, while yelling, Anko Nichan. After that tinder moment was over, Anko reached behind her neck and took off the necklace and handed it to Naruto. I think you lost this gaki. I promise, Anko Nian I won't lost it again, said Naruto as the attack flashed through his mind while he put the necklace on. Gripping the necklace in his hand he lowered his head so that his hair covered his eyes as a question that has been bothering him for a while now came to the surface, and he whispered, Why? What was that Naru-chan? Tsunade said in a concerned voice. Lifting his head up to show a look of sorrow on his face Naruto says, Why? Why do they hate me so much? What did I ever do to deserve this? Why must I suffer like this? Why? 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 He then fell to his knees slammed his fists into the ground. Sunsad knelt down in front of Naruto and enveloped him in a hug while saying in a soothing voice, You haven't done anything wrong, Naru-chan. I didn't want to tell you this right now, but you have a right to know the truth. Both Anko and Shizun get worried looks on their faces. They both fear that Naruto will start to hate them when he learns that he is the Kayubi vessel. Naru-chan, do you remember the story of how the Yandaimi defeated the Kayubi? Of course Kasen, he was able to kill the demon at the cost of his life, everybody knows that story. Tsunade let out a sigh, that not what really happened back then, that was what the younger generation was told so they wouldn't know the truth. Naruto looked at her with confusion all over his face, so he wouldn't learn the truth? What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is the fact that the Yandaimi couldn't kill the Kayubi, so he did the next best thing. He, he sealed it inside of me didn't he? came Naruto's eerily calm voice. This one comment shocked all three of them. Tsunade got a sickening feeling in the bottom of her stomach, and how calm his voice was when making that statement, I've never heard him talk like that before. How did you? I overheard some people talking once about seals a while back. They said that if they could seal me in a box and leave it somewhere, that it would be just as good as killing me. Naruto said in a detached voice. This caused Tsunade to tighten the hug, my god. What have those people done to you? So if Kayubi is sealed into me, then does that mean I'm a demon or what? Tsunade put her hand to his chin and lifted his head so that their eyes made contact. You're not the demon, you're just my little Naru-chan, who just happens to have the Kayubi sealed into him. If you don't believe me, then just think about this, if those people had sealed you into that box, then would that mean the box somehow becomes you just because you were sealed into it? When Naruto heard it explained like that he started realize the truth in those words. A smile started to form as he said, You're right, if I was sealed into a box, then I would be trapped in the box and couldn't get out, but the box would still be a box. So that means that I am still me and the fox is still the fox. Just as Naruto finished his statement, he felt a hand on his shoulder turning his head to see who did it only to look into the smiling face of Anko. That's right Gaki, you are not the fox. You're just my annoying O Tuto who seems to believe the words of the villagers over his Nichan. Did you just call me your O Tuto? Shit, did I say that out loud? Anko grossed her arms and turned her ear away from him. I don't know what you're talking about. Tsunade and Shizun couldn't help but laugh at the antics between Anko and Naruto. Shizun just had to tease the two by saying, Yes, you do, Anko san. It looks like our little Naruto chan has himself a Nichan house in denial. Tsunade decided to end this now before it escalated further. Stop it you two, we have more important thing to do right now. Shizun I need you to go and get all the supplies you will need to start Naru-chan's basic schooling. Yes Tsunade-sama, said Shizun as she heads off to go get the supplies. 
Before Tsunade could give out any more orders, Anko decided to ask a favor, Tsunade-sama do you think I can take over the Gaki training for a while? I want to see how good he's gotten. I guess that's okay, I'll just stand over here in case you want my help. Came Tsunade reply as she headed over to the edge of their training field. No no that's alright why don't you go into town and relax, play some of the games at the casinos. Pleaded Anko, if she sees my training methods, she probably got to overreact or something. At the mention of casinos started to think that wasn't such a bad idea, besides it's not like she'll hurt Naru-chan or anything. Fine but if anything happens to him, it'll be fine, besides it's not like my training is going to kill him or anything. Anko said while waving her hand in a casual manner. After Tsunade left Anko turned to Naruto and got a sinister looking smile on her face, one that caused a shiver to run down his spine. Oh shit, last time she got a look like that I underwent her training from hell. Alright Gaki, I see you can do the tree climbing exercise pretty well. I think it's time to take it up a notch. As she pulled out several kanai Anko continued. You are going to dodge any projectile that I throw at you. But you can only stick to the trees, you can't tough the ground got it. Okay Gaki, ready set. Anko throws a kanai, go. Naruto was able to dodge the first kanai that was thrown at him by ducking. But as soon as he go back to a standing position Anko was already behind him and grabbed both of his arms before saying, didn't I tell you Gaki that you can only as the tree when dodging my attacks. Then she proceeded to throw him up into the trees. As the training went on Naruto was able to dodge more kanai while sticking to the trees. After a few hours of this Anko was getting hungry so she decided that it was time to call it a day. Come on Gaki that enough fun for one day let's head back to get some dango. Fun, fun. You call casing me around and giving me all these cuts and bruises fun? Anko narrowed her eyes and said, yeah how else will you learn anything? Seeing the look she gave him, he knew to not push it any further. Letting out a sigh he said, let's just head back okay. Once they rejoined the others it took both Shizune and Naruto to keep Tsunade from severely hurting Anko, after she found out about Anko's little training session. Needless to say that from then on Anko agreed to use blunt kanai in future sessions. I mean would you want to face the wrath of the slug sonin? Time skip. It's been two weeks since Anko started to help train Naruto, and we find both her and Tsunade sitting at a bar while Shizun handles Naruto's basic schooling. Taking a sip of her sake Tsunade look at Anko and says, we can't just walk back to Konoha and accuse the Uchiha clan of attempted murder without some kind of hard evidence. That's why I need you to be my eyes and ears in Konoha. What do you want me to do Tsunade-sama? Anko says while taking a sip of her own sake. Looking into her sake dish Tsunade answers. I want you to keep close tabs on any Uchiha you think could be involved in Naruto's assault. Collect any evidence you can and bring it to me. But remember this you are not to do anything else without first consulting me got it. Naruto doesn't need to hear that his Nichan got herself incarcerated or worse killed because she acted too rashly. Anko lowered her head and gave a sigh of defeat, Hi Tsunade-sama, I swear I won't do anything rash. Unless I'm provoked that is. Before the conversation could go any further two Konoha shinobi approached their table. One was a man dressed in a standard Jonin outfit. This gentleman had a beard and a cigarette in his mouth. The other one was a woman about the same age as Anko dressed in a standard Chunin outfit with black hair and red eyes. Tsunade's eyes narrowed and feared the worst, did they find out Naruto was still alive? She the said in a cold voice, what do you two want? Both shinobi were shocked by the harsh reception given to them. The man said, I'm sorry for out intrusion, but we have come to see Anko-san. Anko just looked at the two and said, nice to see you Asuma, Kuranai. What do you need to see me for? Asuma just looks at Anko and replies, Hokage-sama has requested that we escort you back to Konoha. Ibiki needs your help interrogating a new prisoner. Can't it wait five more days, I mean I'm on vacation here. Anko said as she took a sip of her sake. Kuranai just shook her head, Anko, you know full well that this can't wait otherwise he wouldn't have sent us to get you. Fine, growls Anko as she stands up. Tsunade also gets up, looks at Anko and says, I'll send Shizun your regards. Then proceeds to walk out of the bar. After Tsunade departs Kuranai looks at Anko and asks, what was that all about? Let's just say she recently learned of something that made her detest Konoha even more. Not that I blame her though. Are you talking about that Naruto kid's death? 
asked Asuma. Anko just glared at him before saying, let's go, and headed off toward Konoha. Knowing full well that Anko was close to the boy, Kurinai just shook her head before saying, idiot. Then follows after Anko. Asuma completely clueless as to what that was all about just shrugged his shoulders before following the other two. Time skip. It's been three years since Tsunade and Shizune found Naruto by the roadside, and in that time he has learned a great deal. Shizune would give him his basic skills such as reading, writing and mathematics, as well as help Tsunade with his medical training. Tsunade for her part would help Naruto with his chakra control by teaching more control exercises such as water walking. She also started to train him in her taijutsu style and he already is quickly starting to master it. Tsunade also made sure that Naruto had as much of a normal childhood as possible. Whenever Anko got a chance to visit, she would work on reinforcing his chakra control and working on his weapon accuracy, by having him do what he so affectionately called, training from hell by Anko Nichan. Speaking of Anko we currently find her jumping from rooftop to rooftop, in the middle of the night, toward the Uchiha district. Her thoughts are currently about how she has yet to acquire anything on the Uchiha clan. Three years. Three bloody years, and I have yet to find a damn thing on those bastards. As she lands on a rooftop adjacent to the Uchiha compound she starts to scan the area for anything out of the ordinary. Through the darkness Anko could make out two figures lying on the ground. Just as she was going to go get a closer look she hears a voice. Hello Anko. Said the cold and calm voice of someone standing behind Anko. As she jumped away from the voice, Anko twisted in mid-air so that when she lands she will be facing the person that knows her name. When she finally sees this person her eyes narrow and one word escapes her lips, Itachi. Showing no emotion to Anko's reaction he simply says, have you come here to stop me? Being caught off guard by that statement Anko had to ask, what the hell are you talking about? I killed off the Uchiha clan, and was on my way out of Konoha when I ran into you. So I ask again are you going to try and stop me? came the calm voice of Itachi, his face showing no emotion when he talked about killing his clan. Anko just shrugs her shoulders and says, not really, if I had known ahead of time, I might have come earlier, just so I could join in. But I do have one question, why? Itachi was mentally surprised by Anko's remake but gave no outward sign of it. Before he turns to leave he tells her, your decision to not interfere is a wise course of action, with that seal on you, you're no threat to me. Anko's hand instinctively went up to her neck and started to rub the seal. As Itachi starts to head toward the outer walls of the village he says one more thing. The reason I killed my clan was because they had become a threat to me. Farewell Anko. After Itachi left Anko just stood there for a little while rubbing the seal on her neck while thinking, what the hell does he mean? Because of the seal I'm no threat to him? After the Uchiha massacre the Sandame Hokage decided to raise the age at which you can graduate from the academy, as a way to prevent another person from gaining too much power at too young of an age. As for Anko she was questioned about what happened that night, she told them everything she knew, minus the fact that she would have joined in and the fact that she basically let him go. It took several months for things to calm down enough for Anko to get some time off so she could go and see Naruto, Tsunade and Shizune to inform them of what she knew about the massacre. When Anko finally caught up with them, they were by a lake. Shizune was sitting on the shoreline watching as Tsunade and Naruto had a sparring match on the lake surface. Naruto jumped back as Tsunade came down with a heel drop spraying water everywhere. As he came in with a counterattack, Tsunade blocked the punch and nailed Naruto in the stomach causing him to go down to his knees. Your counterattack was to slow Naruto. Getting back up to his feet Naruto throw a roundhouse kick aimed at her ribcage. Tsunade quickly countered with a sweep to the other leg causing him to land flat on his back. I told you before, you need to watch that footwork Naruto. Naruto jumped away from Tsunade to get some distance, when Tsunade got into a defensive stance and made a come here motion with her hand in a mocking gesture. The already frustrated Naruto lost his cool and charged in a rage only to find out that Tsunade is holding his left arm behind his back while securing the other arm with her free hand. You can't let yourself become distracted by your frustration in a fight or you lose. Looking toward the shoreline Tsunade notices that Anko has come to visit them. Releasing Naruto from the hold she said, that's enough for today Naruchan, but you still need to work on keeping you cool in battle got that. While rubbing his left wrist Naruto grumbled, 
Yes, Kasan, I'm trying to keep my cool, but it's so frustrating when I can't get a good hit in you know. I know how you feel but keeping your cool will allow you to find a solution to your current problem, but enough about that it looks like we have a visitor. Says Tsunade as she points toward the shore. Anko was amazed at the level of control that Naruto had shown during the fight. Amazing he was able to stay atop the water during the hold fight even when Tsunade-sama got in a few good hits. When did the Gaki get so good at controlling his chakra? Shizune looks over at Anko and says, They've been at it like that for the past couple of hours no. I still can't believe how much stamina Naruto-kun has. Anko could only nod her head in agreement to that statement. Indeed it seemed that Naruto had an almost unlimited amount of energy. He could go on like that for hours and still have enough left to run around afterwards. Anko was brought out of her thought by none other than Naruto as he tackled her saying, I missed you Anko Nichan. Tsunade couldn't help but laugh at the antics of her son, but a quick look from Anko told her that they needed to talk privately. Looking at Shizune, Tsunade said, Shizune why don't you take Naruchan and start his anatomy lesson okay? Shizune understood the underlining message, that she wanted to talk to Anko alone so she nodded and said, Of course Tsunade-sama. Come on Naruto-kun let's go and start your lesson now okay. But I want to spend some time with Anko Nichan, complained Naruto. She will still be here after your lesson now get a move on before she really does have to go back. Said Tsunade as she gave him a look that meant there was no room for discussion. After Shizun took Naruto away Anko got a very serious look on her face and said, Have you heard about the Uchiha massacre? Only rumors that the entire clan was wiped out, so what really happened? Itachi killed his entire clan save for his younger brother Sasuke. As for why he did it all I can tell you is that he said, they have become a threat to him. He said, what aren't you telling me? Getting a sheepish grin and rubbing the back of her head Anko replied, well you see I kind of ran into him when I was doing my surveillance of the Uchiha compound. When I told him I wouldn't fight him he said that because of that seal I was no threat to him. Do you know what he meant by that? Tsunade started to rub her temples after hearing all that Anko had to say. Well he could have meant the fact that when it's active it causes you great pain and you are unable to use your chakra properly. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now let's head back to town so you can visit with that son of mine. Nodding at the explanation given to her about the seal they both head back to town, to catch up with Shizune and Naruto. Tsunade couldn't help but continue think about what Itachi said about Anko's seal. What did you mean Itachi when you said that because of the seal she was no threat? Is there more to that seal than what we already know? I'll have to look into this. It has been one year since the Uchiha massacre and Tsunade was no closer to understanding what Itachi meant about Anko's seal other than what they already figured out. Tsunade had thought about talking to Jiraiya about the seal but there were three reasons that this didn't happen. The first was the simple fact that she has no idea where he was or how she would go about finding him without aimlessly wander all over the place. Something that she had no intention of doing right now. The second was because Jiraiya was a self-proclaimed super pervert, and she didn't want him to try and corrupt her son. The third and most important reason had to do with Naruto himself. She didn't want to gamble on whether Jiraiya would keep quit about Naruto or would he tell Sarutobi-sensei about him. Tsunade may be a chronic gambler but one thing she will not gamble with is the safety of her son. Because of these reasons Tsunade decided to contact Jiraiya as a last resort, but that wouldn't stop her from asking him if they happened to come across each other. So she has been looking for any information she can find about seals at every village that they come across. She would talk to anyone that had any experience with seals and would try to find books on the subject but still no luck and Anko's seal seemed to have been suppressed by whatever method the Hokage used, so she still had time. Right now she had more pressing matters to attend to, like getting back to Naruto's training. Tsunade wanted to try a new type of chakra control technique that would help him if he wanted to try and control Kayubi's chakra in the future. So she had Naruto on the outskirts of town, after picking up some pebbles she starts her lesson. Alright Naru-chan today I'm going to teach you a new control technique. I want you to use these pebbles and keep them perfectly balanced on the tips of your fingers while being able to move your fingers like you normally do, like this okay. After this explanation Tsunade gives a demonstration of the technique by moving her fingers around while keeping the pebbles on the tips of her fingers. Come on Kasan this will be easy. I was hoping for a more challenging exercise, I'll have this mastered by the end of the day. 
said a confident Naruto. Confident aren't we? It's not as easy as you think it is but how about we make a little wager on it huh? A bet Kasan? Yes a bet, if you can get to the point where you can do this exercise with your left hand by the end of 3 days, then I'll give up sake for a week. Naruto was shocked by this statement. His Kasan was willing to give up sake for a week just to prove him wrong. His only response was, really? Yes really, but if I win you have to give up ramen for a week. What? Not the ramen anything but my ramen, yelled a shocked Naruto. What? Did my little Naru-chan lose all his confidence already? What happened to mastering it in one day? I'm giving you three full days to learn it, pretty generous of me don't you think? Tsunade said to egg him on. Naruto thought about it for a moment before saying, okay it's a bet, but are there any other restrictions besides the time limit? Puzzled Tsunade decided to see where this line of questioning was leading to, no I won't put any other restrictions. So why did you want to know about that anyway? Naruto just rubbed the back of his head while giving a sheepish grin, no real reason really, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to be cheating using this move. Raising her eyebrows slightly Tsunade asked, what move? Naruto's sheepish grin turned into a foxy grin as his hands formed a cross seal as he shouted, cage bunshin no justu, as five Naruto's appeared. Tsunade eyes widened in shock, what the hell? Cage bunshins. Where the hell did he learn Cage Bunshin no Justu? Naru Chan, where did you learn that move and why haven't you used it before when we were training? He rubbed the back of his head again while saying, Well, you see. Flashback six months ago on Naruto's birthday. Anko had just finished up one of Naruto's training sessions when she asked him a question Hey Gaki, how many ninjutsu skills do you have? Well, all Kasan has taught me is Kawarimi, Henge, and Bunshin no Justu. Aside from that just some medial just you. Why? Well I thought I would give you a special just you for your birthday present. It's called cage bunshin no just to. Said Anko with a grin on her face. But Anko Nichan I already know a bunshin just you. Said an annoyed Naruto. Hitting him on his head Anko responses. It's not a regular bunshin gaki this just you creates solid clones not just illusions but the best part of all is that when you dispel them that you gain all of their experience. Meaning you could use this just you to learn at an incredible rate. Naruto's eyes got real wide hearing this and said, Awesome I can use those clone for all sort of sneak attacks when I get into a real fight. Hurry up Nichan, I want to learn this just you before we go and meet back up with Kasan and Shizun Nichan. Anko couldn't help but smile at her Oto Oto's enthusiasm at wanting to learn a new just you. Alright Gaki here's how it done. End flashback. And that's how I learned it Kasan, said Naruto. Tsunade just shook her head after hearing Naruto explanation, why am I not surprised? Anyway now why don't you tell me why you haven't used it before now? Well I don't like to use it when I'm learning something new it just feels like I'm cheating or something, but I do use it when I want to refine any of skills. Then why are you using it to learn this technique? Since my ramen is at stake here, I'll use everything at my disposal to win. Said all five Naruto's as they started to train. As Tsunade watched him train she started to regret ever making this bet. I have a feeling that I'm going to have a rough week after this is over. When we get back I'll just have to drink my fill till then, but if he can master this then I think it's time for him to learn some of my more advanced techniques. Tsunade feeling turned out to be true as Naruto mastered the control exercise, winning the bet and teaching Tsunade to never bet against him. After a miserable week without her sake Tsunade finally decided to teach Naruto how to summon. As Naruto was signing the slug contract, Shizune decided to talk to Tsunade about this. Tsunade sama do you think he ready for this, I mean he is still just a kid after all. You worry too much Shizune, trust me if he can master the pedal exercise in 3 days he'll be able to do this easily. Said a proud Tsunade, but still don't you think you're giving him too much power for his age? That's enough Shizun, he'll be fine. Have faith in him, we raised him better than to let it go to his head. I know but, Shizun never got to finish that sentence as they felt Naruto building up his chakra. After Naruto finished signing the contract, he bit his thumb and went through the hand seals that his Kasan showed him, before slamming his hand into the ground while saying, Kachiyose no Jutsu. When the smoke cleared the same slug that delivered the messages to Anko all those years ago was before Naruto. Impressive Naruto-sama to be able to summon me on your first try. You're definitely someone my mistress Katsuyu will want to keep an eye on. 
said the slug before disappearing in a puff of smoke. Naruto just stared at the spot where the slug had been before saying, wait don't I even get to say hello. Tsunade started to laugh at the events that had just transpired. You'll have to forgive Kamikeo for her abruptness it's just in her nature to report directly to Katsuyu when she finds something of interest. If he's already able to get to this level in his summoning, then I think I'll have him figure out how to use my super strength on his own, with just a couple of hints along the way. Shizune for her part was just in a state of shock, Naruto-kun was able to summon a slug of that size on his first attempt, turning her head to look at Naruto walking over to them, just giving one of his foxy grins while he has both hands behind his head she could only think, I see what Tsunade-sama meant now, no matter how much power he acquires, it doesn't change him at all. It's like he was always meant to have it. Time skip. It's been one year since Naruto learned to summon and his progress with Tsunade's super strength technique has been slow. Even with Tsunade's hint it has taken him this long to get the basics of using his chakra to heighten his strength. In fact this is what we find Naruto working on right now. He is standing on the water in the middle of the lake with Shizune by the shoreline leaning against a tree trunk reading a book. With her pet Tun Tun sleeping beside her. While Tsunade is in town taking care of her business, Naruto was staring at one of the pebbles in his hand trying to figure out how to use his chakra to enhance his strength so he can embed the pebble into the tree trunk that Shizune was leaning starts to channel his chakra while thinking, let's see if I can control my chakra enough to enhance and strengthen my muscles to do this. Naruto takes aim and flicks the pebble toward the shore. Shizune was really enjoying the book she was reading when she suddenly felt something whiz past her head and then she heard a cracking sound behind her. Turning her head to look at what caused the noise, looking at the tree she sees a small pebble embedded into the bark. Shizune looked back over at Naruto to see him jumping up and down in joy. She then looked back at the tree trunk. Did Naruto-kun figure out how to do it already? And Naruto-kun, how did you do that? Before Naruto could answer clapping could be here as Tsunade came walking up to the to tree trunk. Well done Naru-chan, looks like you were finally able to figure out the basics for my strength. I'm impressed it took Shizune about a year and a half before she figured it out. Now we can focus of strengthening it and making it a permanent and we will also work on how to meditate because I think it's time that you learn how to access Kayubi's chakra. Over the next few months Naruto had a hard time learning how to meditate. The main reason for this was his mind was always on alert. Even tough he's been with Tsunade and Shizune for more than 5 years he still had a hard time letting his defenses down. When Tsunade found out about this, she couldn't help but feel sorry for Naruto and her anger toward what Konoha has done to him would grow. As time pasted Tsunade did everything she could to help Naruto realize that he no longer had to keep his defenses all the time. Then one day as Naruto was trying to meditate he heard what sounded like a low growl. Opening his eyes, he was surprised to find himself in what looked like a sewer. Naruto lowered his head and just sighed, great, just great, I guess this gives new meaning to the saying having your mind in the gutter. After hearing another growl echo through the corridors, Naruto just shrugged his shoulders and thought, might as well follow the sound, as he headed down the corridor. Eventually he came before a large gate with a paper that had, seal, written on it. Two big glowing red eyes can be seen behind the gate as a loud voice says, so my jailer has decided to grace me with his presence, as a giant fox comes out of the shadows behind the gate. Naruto's eyes narrow at the fox as he says, so you're the great Kayubi I've read so much about. You're also the cause of all the hatred I got while I lived in Konoha. Kayubi mentally flinched at the last comment before saying, don't believe everything you read kid. You might be surprised by what you find. Naruto raised an eyebrow and said, and what would surprise me? Kayubi get a smile on its face as it says, well for starters this. Then the giant fox starts to transform into a human appearance. The first thing Naruto noticed as the Kayubi came into view was the fact that the great demon fox was in fact a woman, and a beautiful one at that with shoulder length blood red hair. She was wearing a red battle kimono with a navy blue sash around her waist black shinobi style pants with white wrapping around her shins and a black pair of shinobi sandals. Naruto had to admit that his was indeed surprised, none of the text he read about the Kayubi ever mentioned that the demon fox was in fact a girl. Kayubi couldn't help but laugh at the look of shock on Naruto's face. 
After she calmed down she got a sad look on her face before saying, Look kid I just want to say that I'm sorry for how your life has been like before you met that Tsunade person. I'm not asking for forgiveness or anything like that, and I can understand if you hate me, but I just wanted you to know that's all. If Naruto was shocked before he was totally floored by that statement. What the hell? I figured that Kayubi would be a bloodthirsty monster or something. If she's being honest with me then who knows what else about her has been misleading. After recovering from his shock Naruto decided to ask, look there's nothing to forgive, you weren't responsible for the treatment I received when I lived in Konoha, and anyway I have a couple of questions. First would have to be why did you attack Konoha in the first place? The second would have to be why everyone always refers to you as a bloodthirsty monster. Kayubi was surprised by the fact that Naruto didn't blame her for what happened to him. Then she heard his questions and she sighed before saying, I'm not ready to talk about why I attacked Konoha yet kid but I will tell you that I had my reasons. Fair enough I guess but when you're ready I would like to know. Fine, Kayubi said before she got a smile on her face and continued. Now about your second question. I've been around for thousands of years kid so naturally I've gotten a reputation for being a bit aggressive when I get mad. A bit aggressive? If I believe what I've read, you've leveled entire cities for crying out loud. Kayubi gets a sheepish smile on her face and uses her right index finger to scratch her cheek before saying, well you know what they say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorn. Naruto just stared at her for a second before saying, you have got to be kidding me. You're telling me that you leveled those cities because someone pissed you off? Kayubi just shrugged her shoulders and Naruto brought his hand up to his lowered head and started to shake it back and forth. Unbelievable. Remind me to never get on your bad side Ba-chan. A vein started to pulse on Kayubi's forehead as she clenched her fist and yelled, I'm not old. But you said that you've been around for thousands of years, so you must be really old Kayubi Obachan. Kayubi just sweat dropped after hearing that and then she just shook her head and decided to get to the point. Look kid. Let's just get back to the original reason that you came here okay. That being you want to gain access to my chakra correct. Naruto just nods his head and lets her continue. I've seen how your training has been going and I must say that I'm impressed. So I've decided that along with giving you access to my chakra, when I deem it necessary, I'll also be training you in the art of genjutsu. Naruto was completely surprised by this, and he couldn't help but ask this question, why are you offering to help train me? Consider it an apology for all the pain my coming to Konoha has caused you, said Kayubi with a sad smile. After thinking about it Naruto could see no cons for taking up her offer. Alright I agree to your offer besides my genjutsu need a lot of work anyways. With the two of them coming to an agreement Naruto returns to the real world, where he is greeted by a concerned Tsunade and Shizune. After explaining what just happened in his talk with Kayubi, Tsunade reluctantly agreed with Naruto's decision with the condition that Naruto will tell her everything that Kayubi teaches him. Time skip. So over the next four years Naruto's skill improves with Tsunade and Shizune helping him with medical just you and taijutsu, Anko's help in ninjutsu, weapons and speed, and Kayubi helps him with genjutsu and also giving him tips on how to increase his speed. Naruto's appearance has changed over the years, he let his hair grow a little longer, about the yandaimi hair length with the hair on the back of his head being a little long to put it in a low ponytail, a fishnet shirt with an orange sleeveless battle robe, a blue sash around his waist, black ambu style pants with white shin guards, and your standard shinobi footwear. Now we find Naruto celebrating his 14th birthday at a ramen shop with Tsunade, Shizune and Anko. As he opened the gift Anko got him he was happy to get a tan trench coat that looked just like Anko's. Naruto put on the trench coat and then got a smile on his face and said, Perfect fit, thanks Anko Nichan I've been thinking about getting one for a while now. How did you know? Anko just gives a quick glance over towards Tsunade and ruffled his hair before saying, I have my sources Gaki I'm just glad you like it. Naruto pushes Anko's hand off his head while saying, Stop that Anko Nichan I'm not a little kid anymore you know. The group just laughed at Naruto's antics, he opened Shizune gift next only to find a brand new kanai and shuriken set. Thanks Shizune Nichan I've been needing a new set my old one is starting to get a little worn down. Shizune just smiled and said, you're welcome, Naruto-kun. After Naruto finished putting his new weapons away Tsunade walks up to him looks him in the eye. Kami please let this feeling I have be right. 
It just feels like he should have this. Tsunade reaches behind her neck and takes off her necklace. Naru chan I want to give you this. Says Tsunade as she places the necklace around his neck over top the necklace that Anko gave him on his fifth birthday. Naruto widened his eyes in shock, knowing full well the story behind it. Kasen I'm not little anymore you don't have to call me that anymore. And besides this belonged to great grandfather as well as, he looked down and let the sentence drag out. Tsunade just smiled and said, you'll always be my little Naruchan. Causing Naruto to pout a little. Shizune decided to ask, Tsunade-sama why? Tsunade looked reflective as she said, watching Naruchan's training over the years got me to thinking about it, and you know what it just felt like the right thing to do. Hearing the tone in Tsunade's voice Shizune and Naruto knew not to press the issue. Naruto just looks down at the necklace before smiling up at Tsunade and said, Thanks Kasen I promised to take good care of it, and prove to you that your feeling was right. Just as Naruto finished his sentence a voice saying, Tsunade, was heard from the front door of the shop. Tsunade turned her head toward the door only to see the one person she was not expecting to see the only word to escape her lips was, Jiraiya? What are you doing here? Naruto looked over at the door to see a man with white spiky hair made up in a ponytail a headband with the kanji for oil on it a scroll on his back, with a green robe and pants with a red vest. His only response was to ask, Kasen who is this guy? Before Tsunade could answer Jiraiya goes into one of his introductions by hopping around on one foot, one arm stretched out and the other behind his head. He starts to say, I'm known as the Great Toad Sage but that is just an alias. North, South, East, and West. I am the Toad. Tsunade comes up behind Jiraiya and hits him in the head, cut the Theatrix Jiraiya. Jiraiya rubs the back of his head as he says, Man Suheim is that anyway to greet an old friend. Jiraiya then notices the boy that is with Tsunade and his eyes widen in shock. It can't be, I was told he was dead. Getting a serious look on his face he points to Naruto and asks, Tsunade is that who I think it is? Tsunade got a worried look on her face before asking, and who do you think he is? Cut the crap Tsunade. The look on your face tells me that I'm right. He's Naruto Uzumaki isn't he? This causes everyone in the group to stop what they were doing and look over at Jiraiya. Tsunade gives him a harsh glare and responds with, and what if he is? Well first off I would like to know how he is still alive and how he came to be with you. So Tsunade reluctantly told Jiraiya the story of their first meeting and her taking him on as her son and apprentice, getting in contact with Anko, and all the training he's done. By the end of the story Jiraiya couldn't help but feel a mixture of anger and happiness for everything that has happened to the boy. Tsunade had to ask, so now that you know the whole story what do you plan to do now? Jiraiya thought about it for a while before raising his fist in the air and saying, right now nothing besides it looks like I interrupted a party so let's get back to it. So they resumed the party for a while before it was staring to get late, at the end of the party Tsunade takes Jiraiya outside so they can have a private conversation. Alright Jiraiya what are you really planning to do about my son? Jiraiya just looks at her before sighing. Look Suheim I really don't plan on doing anything about him. I mean he really does seem to be happy here. But you can't really blame him. I mean he's surrounded by beautiful woman 24-7. Man some people have all the luck. Tsunade just shook her head. I see you haven't changed. Anyway since we ran into each other there is something I want to ask you. Can you look into what the seal on Anko is really supposed to do? This caught Jiraiya's attention, what exactly do you mean by that? Well a few years ago someone told Anko that she was no threat to them because of the seal that she has, so I've been trying to find out what this person meant by that. I haven't been able to find out anything out on my own. So you would like me to look into it huh? He thinks about it for a minute before saying, I'll help you out Suheim, I can't just leave someone to Orochimaru's twisted plans now can I? Tsunade let out a sigh of relief before looking back at Jiraiya, there's just one more favor I need to ask, and that is could you keep the fact that Naruto is still alive to yourself. I don't want anyone that wants to harm him to find out he's still alive. Fine I'll keep your secret for a now, but you have to realize that you can't keep it a secret forever. They will find out eventually you know. Jiraiya said in a serious voice. Tsunade puts her head down and says, I know Jiraiya but when that time comes I want him to be ready. I want Konoha to realize what a mistake it was to just throw him away like that. Jiraiya it pains me to ask this as well but do you think you could help Naru-chan with his ninjutsu skills? 
Enko san has already taught him some justice, but she doesn't want to teach him any of Orochimaru's justice. Let me think about it, okay? You know, I said I wouldn't train anybody else after he died. Tsunade just nods and then returns to the party, leaving Jiraiya to his thoughts. Man, when Serutobi sensei asked me to keep track of Anko to see if she had become a threat to the village, I didn't expect to find this. He looks up at the night sky and sighs, Sorry, Suheim, but I will have to tell him that Anko meets up with you and your new family, so he knows that Anko isn't going to betray us, but I won't tell him that the boy is Naruto. Though he may figure it out. Then he too goes to rejoin the party. That's all for now. If you enjoy, then please like, share, and do comments.